Welcome to our town hall meeting and thank you to Heather Gibbons, our ASL interpreter for supporting today's event. Today, I'm also joined by mental health program manager, Stephanie Edler, Lowell Elementary School social worker, Tracy Thompson, and Robert Eagle Staff middle school worker, middle school social worker, Carrie Siebertson. Carrie was recently named the 2020 National School Social Worker of the Year. We have great people working at Seattle Public Schools and congratulations, Carrie. We're just a few days away from the winter break. Um, the winter and holiday season can be a time of heightened stress, especially after this long, challenging year. Um, so that's why we thought it was important to have this town hall focused on mental health supports for students, staff, and families. Now, more than ever, it's important to take care of ourselves and one another. We may be uh, mourning the ability to see family or friends, burnt out from the expectations of day-to-day -day, um, events um, or our demands, overwhelmed with how to maintain family traditions, impacted from mental health needs, or we may be grieving the loss of our loved ones. If we don't care for ourselves, it will be hard to care for others in our families and in our community. While we may be all feeling the effects of the pandemic, mental health needs and accessing support can look different for everyone, and it can look different across cultures. Today, staff will share more about district and community mental health resources and how Seattle Public Schools is here to partner with you. Before I pass it over to Stephanie, Tracy, and Carrie, I want to share some important news. Um, I'm happy to announce that last week I appointed two cabinet level leaders. First, Dr. Keisha Scarlett will take the helm as the new Chief Academic Officer. Dr. Scarlett is currently our Chief of Equity, Partnerships, and Engagement. She is a multi-generational resident of Seattle and a graduate of Seattle Public Schools. Dr. Scarlett's um, vast educational leadership experiences range from her early career in STEM at Boeing to her work as a STEM teacher at Asa Mercer Middle School. She was also principal of South Shore Pre-K-8, human resources director, and her current position as the Chief of Equity Partnerships and Engagement Division. Dr. Scarlett has dedicated her career to advocating for and creating academic opportunities and environments that tap into the inherent brilliance of students, particularly those furthest from educational justice. She's on a mission to, to normalize Black excellence and to eliminate opportunity gaps the gap between inferior opportunities and superior opportunities. She pushes the system to do better and to be better for young people. Dr. Scarlett will replace Dr. Diane DeBacker, who is leaving SPS to return to her home state of Kansas. I want to thank Dr. DeBacker for her tenacity, her smarts, her humor, and her grace during one of the most challenging moments in the history of public education. Dr. DeBacker's leadership will be missed, but like me, she knows that she's leaving her division in very good hands. To fill Dr. Scarlett's former position, I'm happy to appoint James Bush to lead the Equity Partnerships and Engagement Division. For the past four years, James has served as our Executive Director of School and Community Partnerships. Under his leadership, the district has secured $130 million in city families education preschool and promise grants supporting 30 schools through 2026. He's helped open 18 emergency child care sites in spring 2020 and 47 child care centers in, during this uh, school year. And those child care centers serve 2000 students daily. He's helped build institutional alignment between SPS and low income housing partners, leveraging cross organizational expertise to reach and support students furthest away from educational opportunities, and he's helped develop a variety of data resources to support partner organizations in tracking, monitoring, and supporting SPS students. Prior to join S joining SPS, James served as the Neighborhood Programs Manager at the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods, where he managed a variety of community building programs. He's also served as the key leader 
in the City of Seattle Race and Social Justice Initiative for three of Seattle mayors. It's testament to the overall strength and excellence of our staff that we can fill these positions with such high caliber individuals. We are very fortunate that Dr. Scarlett and James have accepted their new roles and will continue to lead our district during these challenging times. Finally, I wanna give a short update about our planning for a return to in-person learning. Earlier this month, staff and I presented recommendations to the school board to expand in-person instruction for about 2,000 of our students receiving special education services and students in pre-K through first grade as early as March 2021. Tomorrow, the board will discuss and vote this on this recommendation during their regular board meeting. You can visit our website for more information on how to tune in to that board meeting. I'm going to now pass it over to our mental health program manager, Stephanie, um, and where they will talk about some of the supports that we have in place. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, um, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Stephanie Other, and again, I'm the new program manager for mental health for Seattle Public Schools. Um, I want to start off by thanking Superintendent Juno for highlighting the impacts this past year has had on mental health as well as the disparities and impacts across different cultures and the importance of taking care of ourselves and each other. Um, historically, we know that mental health trends have been increasing over the years. Um, and what we are seeing now are significant um, increase in those trends from depression, anxiety, grief and loss, uh, suicidality, and a variety of different variables um, that can impact uh, the emotional well-being and our ability to cope during this time. Sometimes um, what we do fail to recognize in the midst of struggle, how resilient and powerful our community is and our ability to overcome adversity and engage in strengths. Um, this is unfamiliar territory for some, but it's definitely not unfamiliar territory for us all. Um, some of these struggles that have been impacting us have been impacting some of our youth and family for years. So I know a lot, um, I think some of the big questions and curiosity is what is our system doing to support mental health and the needs of our students, families, and staff? Um, comprehensive, we're looking at a comprehensive approach to mental health and suicide prevention and intervention that aligns with best practices and building, uh, excuse me, building capacity to support the needs of our students, uh, families, and staff. Um, this could look like partnering with community-based providers and organizations to really look at what's um, exploring community impacts, uh, the needs of our families and the barriers to accessing support, as well as connecting with larger organizations such as NAMI, Forefront, PSESD, Crisis Connections, and Department of Health to really look at our preventative intervention and postvention models to help prepare and mitigate any factors that are impacting our community. Um, additionally, we're looking at partnering, or we have been, excuse me, partnering and taking input from student and family voice. Currently, we're working with Asian Counseling Referral Services. Uh, their Youth Advisory Board has pushed out a mental health campaign. And what is really unique about this is it gives us student insight and experience of mental health awareness, um, helping to reduce the stigma and also exploring how to uh, best serve providing supports to our youth. Um, also acknowledging family's voice and the importance of uh, connecting with our families and understanding the barriers and their needs. We know that our uh, parents and caregivers are doing so much right now for their, for their children and the impacts are really heavy in terms of this remote setting. The remote, um, the remote learning has significantly also impacted and is very heavy for our staff. Uh, our staff are doing um, a lot of work that is dedicated hours to provide education to our community and knowing that the core value of being a teacher is that student teacher connection as well as providing education to help support the success of our students. So currently we have a wellness team that is exploring staff needs through staff voice. We recognize that um, in order to be helpful and supportive, we need their voices to know how to do that. We have developed a wellness workshops and group opportunities but are continuing to look at how do we support our staff who in tune are supporting our students and families. Additionally, we are continuing to consult on the building level and supporting our students and family in the remote setting. So we're providing and updating resource information to support staff such as school nurses, social workers, family support workers, and guidance counselors to help update information of how they can provide support to our youth. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Carrie Severson who um, will speak about the building level support.
Thank you, Stephanie. I am Carrie Siebertson, and I am the school social worker currently at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School. This is my 14th year in the district. Um, I was nine years at Chief Self International High School, went up to the district office in their behavioral de health department, and then came back down um, to open Robert Eagle Staff Middle School three and a half years ago under Dr. Um, Marnie Campbell. Um, I uh, thank you for, for inviting me to talk about this critically important topic, especially this time of year um, amidst uh, these dual pandemics that we face. Um, just to speak a little bit about what we are doing at the building level to support um, the mental health of our students. Um, really our teachers are the front lines and the relationship builders to our students and families. And they, um, are really being that connecting point. Um, you know, across the district, we're doing social emotional learning. And so um, a lot of pro proactive and preventive um, learning and modeling and teaching of self-management, self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, and um, responsible decision-making. We're really also, um, the goal is really to have a trusted adult in the building that students can access. And that might be an instructional assistant. It might be um, the administrative um, secretary at the, at the front office. We just want families to feel like there is a connection point and a trusted adult to access. Um, our, our goal too at the building level is that sense of belonging and connection. And teachers are doing that every day in their virtual classrooms. Um, uh, <clears throat> in addition, you know, things like at Eagle, Eagle Staff that we're doing is um, in addition to our, our classroom communities, we have enrichment clubs, um, affinity groups, we have grade level lunches for social connection, and um, we have WEB, which is where everybody belongs. It's a transition program for our sixth graders coming in, our eighth graders mentoring and leading our sixth graders through the transition into middle school. Um, once you know we're finding that students need additional support beyond the classroom, um, we have behind the scenes really some amazing expertise within our buildings. Um, we have what's called our ESA or Educational Staff Associate Certification, and we are school nurses, school social workers, school counselors, and school psychologists. Um, and really, uh, we we are sort of we are have training and expertise as it relates to mental health and. And our jobs are really to, to support students and how that translates into the classroom environment and how it impacts the classroom environment. So we're coaching teachers on how to communicate effectively, how to um, build on the students' strengths. Um, we're also being the liaison with the family about how can we better support and partner with them for their student success in the classroom. In addition, um, you know, as a social worker and the counselors in my building, we do one-on-one -on -one check ins with students, um, counseling support. We do small groups, um, small groups, support groups, coping skills groups, just different things that trying to, to support our students' diverse needs. Um, and then in addition to that, we're also, um, you know, so many families are connected to multiple systems. So um, they're in the mental health system, they might be in the housing system, they might be in um, child protective services, juvenile justice. And so our job is really to help and provide wraparound services and, and, and connect with those key people in that family's life so that we can um, better support and provide a robust plan within the, within the school. Um, just in addition to kind of some of the parent and, and um, I'm a parent myself, I have a second grader and fifth grader, and um, so it's really critically important me, for, to me and my work to partner with the parents. Um, so we're doing some family nights in our ELL teams monthly. We're meeting with, um, we're doing different topics. Tomorrow night we're doing one on improving our self-esteem, improving our child's self-esteem. Um, I've partnered with PTSA to do a night on, um, on how to do some emotional self-care for yourself and your teen and your family. Um, and just to lastly acknowledge that really truly this, this burden is on our parents and they are bearing the brunt of this. And um, I just, what I wanna sort of communicate is that just to being brave and courageous and reaching out to your school because we are here to support and partner with you. And that is our, our main goal. And um, the, the kind of unique part of our role is that we do have confidentiality that we need to follow that um, whatever we talk about stays between us unless it's a safety issue or concern. So we want you to feel that trust and connection within your building as a result of that. Um, so I am going to 
turn this over to Tracy um, Thompson. She is down at an elementary level. I could kind of provide some examples of our um, secondary level supports. Um, and I'm gonna pass it on to Tracy to talk a little bit more about the elementary level supports. Thank you. Tracy, I think you're muted. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, this is Tracy Thompson. I'm the social worker at Lowell Elementary. This is my 20th year in Seattle School with the Seattle School District. Um, I'm currently at the elementary level after being um, at the district level. Um, I just want to acknowledge the amazing work that I see uh, from the families. Um, one of the things that has just resounded with me is our families, they're the expert on what's best for their child. And I just want to acknowledge that and acknowledge the amazing work that is going on at the building level with the teachers, the family and community. I see some amazing partnerships taking place that maybe wouldn't have taken place uh, outside of this pandemic. So this is an opportunity for us to continue to build. Um, one of the things that we do at Lowell, we have a social emotional team and um, we go through every week, uh, we go through each grade level, student by student, grade level by grade level. And it's an opportunity for staff um, and our social emotional learning team to address any needs. And we have a team, we have our school nurse, uh, our AP, our principals, family support worker, um, and our PBS, PBIS coach. And it's an opportunity to ad address any needs that we see on the social emotional, on the academic level, on the basic need level, which has been huge. Um, and um, one of the things um, just at our school, we've provided families and parents an opportunity and open door to call to email, to um, just tell us what is going on. And we as a team, we look at ways and how we can address those. And that's where the partnerships are important. Um, we have partnered with some local churches, businesses, uh, Odessa Brown, school-based health clinics, um, Atlantic Street Therapeutic Health Services, other programs to address the needs of our family. Um, and, um, one of the one of the things that I have noticed is the isolation, not just among our students, but our parents. Um, and um, so just providing like that listening ear, um, you know, and the our secretary and I, we came up with an idea. We have postcards with our uh, school logo on them and we will we'll send them out to families. Just very informal, just we're thinking about you. Here you go. Um, just letting people know that we're here. Um, and the feedback has been great. Lowell is a very special community. Um, it's a wonderful place to be. The staff is highly committed. They go above and beyond. Um, if there is a need, it we try to address it, uh, whether it's basic needs, social, emotional, academics, uh, making sure we our students have laptops, hotspots, food, uh, whatever it is, we try to address it. Um, one of the things that we also do, because we realize as we support families, the toll that it can take on we the educators. So we come together and we do things uh, to keep our morale up, like um, at our weekly staff meetings, have a dance, a dance party, um, just check-ins. Uh, how are you doing? How can we support you? Um, things like that. Um, and really, like I said, we we really just encourage the parents just to know that this it's gonna it's not okay, but this is gonna be okay. And we're gonna get through this together. And we're gonna link arms. And we're gonna get through this. And this too shall pass. And we're gonna come out on the other end. And we're here to help. Um, and one of the wonderful things I, I spoke to it earlier about partnerships. Um, 
We're also partnering within each other. Carrie over at uh, Eagle Staff, uh, the others, the other schools, we come together, we talk, uh, and we address needs and how can we support each other. Uh, what are some best practices? You know, we get stuck too as professionals, and that's where our other uh, our colleagues step in and help us. So, again, I just want to salute the parents. I want to salute the families, and just we will we will get through this together. And as I close, um, this is an opportunity for questions. Thank you all Thank you for, for uh, being a part of this and sharing the good work. I just, I really appreciate um, everything you all are doing. Um, you know, as you all spoke to, it's not easy being in a remote learning in the middle of a pandemic and the struggles that happen with learning at home and, um, you know, just everyday life still continues and just the struggle. So I just thank you for working with our students and our young people and putting supports in place. We do have a couple questions that came in. Um, there's a couple I'm going to collapse about. Um, if a family really needs support uh, or resources in the community and they their child is in crisis, like who can they call on weekends or after hours and is there, are there people in the school that can help them navigate um, the process and finding supports? Mm -hmm. I, I can answer Carrie, that. Carrie, you want to tag team on this? Oh, sure. Go ahead, Tracy. Go ahead. Okay. Well, um, if they're having like, you know, crises, they can contact the crisis clinic. Um, and, you know, they can also reach out to that trusted adult in the building, which oftentimes it is the teacher who will then reach out to myself, the social worker or, or the school counselor in the building. Yeah, during the school day, if you are noticing um, some needs in the moment, um, certainly contacting anyone from the building level is important. We have an internal communication system, so anytime there is a real significant need brought to an adult in the building, um, we, we have a, a, a communication chain of making sure that we're doing all the right steps to ensure the safety and support of and well-being of a child. Um, outside of, of building hours or school hours, there is that crisis connections, 24-hour um, crisis line, crisisconnections.org. Um, in addition, for those teens, there's Teen Link, which is trained teens on the other line to be able to support um, through chat, through text, through phone, um, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. every night. Um, that's just, we have the infrastructure to really support um, those, those people and um, to support our teens and our families outside of, of school hours. Yeah, thanks for pointing everybody in the, the direction of the resources that um, are out there and available. Um, how can, like what, if people, you know, everybody's at home and remote working and remote learning, but what are some of the things that people should look for? Um, how does a parent recognize if their child may need some mental health support? I can take that again. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I would say really, truly, parents, you are the expert of your child and you will notice when you're seeing changes in their in their presentation, in their mood, in their interactions, in their self care. Um, I think explicitly checking in with them is a really important time right now. How are you feeling today? Um, how has this been for you? Sometimes um, our, our, our kids are, are kind of uh, they're they're not talking openly about what's going on but they're showing it in different ways and um, if you're seeing changes in their mood if you're saying seeing increased ir irritability or lashing out excessive worry if you're seeing changes in sleeping or eating patterns um, if they're having struggles with concentration or remembering things those are kind of some signs um, some changes in their personal hygiene um, and then sort of increased risk risky behavior so if they're engaging in drugs and alcohol, sexual behavior, um, if they're talking about death or suicide or you're, or they're showing signs of self-harm, um, then those are, those are some trigger warnings for you to access more support and to really partner with the schools in accessing that support. 
And then, you know, remote learning is really difficult for a lot of people, a lot of students. What, what do you recommend that people do at home um, to cope with, um, you know, Teams fatigue or screen fatigue um, and the impacts of social isolation? What kinds of supports can families put in place? Um, I think some of the supports that families can put in place is put some boundaries around screen time and, and engaging more in family time or time away from their screens. Um, also, I think as what Carrie said and even what Tracy said is like really engaging with your kids and having those conversations, asking how they're doing, um, you know, um, having conversations about who is a supportive adult for you if you feel like you need it and kind of where they can turn. But I think definitely looking at putting some boundaries and spending some time away from screen times, whether it's phone, whether it's computer, whether it's TV, um, structuring your day, they talk a lot about just building consistency, predictability, and structure in your home environment as we do at schools. And so are you um, taking time to go outside, take a walk, or again, removing yourself from some of those environments that might be creating some of your stress? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I think too that? about, I, I talked to families about, you know, establishing that routine, like, like yes. Stephanie said. Um, as if they're going to school, our nighttime bedtime routine and our morning routine, um, brushing our teeth, making our bed, getting up and making sure that our, our, our learning environment is set up um, for, for learning. And then also practicing and, and modeling coping strategies with that Zoom fatigue and being on a screen all day. What are you as adults sort of showing your mm -hmm. own child? Like how, how are you getting outside? What are some of the self-care things that you're establishing um, daily to support yourself and how are you modeling that for, for your family? I agree. Routines are important and looking for every opportunity um, to get outside, get some fresh air, um, go for a walk, go around the block, just anything, go to the post office, any any excuse to get outside, even in the, this, you know, rainy northwest weather. Yeah, I mean, I've I've explored my neighborhood so much. It's just sort of like I just take a lot of walks around. It sort of helps just get away for a minute and uh, look around. Um, so yeah. just speaking of that, like what what are what's SPS doing to help the adults in our system and what kinds of things are we doing to support staff? Because we know that the adults have to be well in order to support students in a robust manner too. And so what kinds of supports are there for the adults? I mean, I think right now we're really focusing a lot on staff wellness. We know that our staff are needing just as much support or even more in terms of the context of what they're working in, either working from home, as Carrie said, working from home, educating your own kids and working really long hours. And again, I think it's in the core belief of wanting the best for their students. And so part of us um, are looking at in terms of a, a wellness team is really trying to explore how can we be supportive and how can we help in terms of what you're communicating to us of what you need um, and recognizing that the hours are tough and it's a strain. And so building either groups where we can come together and really support one another, providing uh, wellness workshops where we can learn how to cope and recognize how we feel are some of the things that we are currently um, pushing out for, for adults and staff, but we know that there's more need there as well. Mm -hmm. I think within our own school communities too, um, we are supporting one another just through our professional learning communities, through um, our professional development, just different ways that we are finding small pockets to be able to be vulnerable with each other, to talk about what the struggles are with technology, what the struggles are with connecting with our students, um, you know, professional struggles that also impact us personally, but having those in building communities are so critical right now for us to be well ourselves get the support we need to support our kids, our students. Yeah, thanks. So knowing we're heading into a Chris, our winter break, uh, what's what's your fast advice for uh, people to do over the break? Finding connection. Mm -hmm. um, like looking out for, I talk about um, turn towards bids. So if your kid or your family is reaching out, initiating some sort of connection, finding that authentic, genuine connection with them, whether it be watching a YouTube video or jumping on the trampoline or just finding the joy in the small things, I think are really critically important right now. And, and also practicing gratitude. What, what, what are the things that we do have in our lives that we're thankful for that um, actually 
it actually fires off serotonin and dopamine in our brains um, if we practice gratitude. So I think that part of that is just um, one thing I would say for, for the break. Yeah. That's wonderful. I agree with that. Um, attitude of gratitude. We've had so many losses, um, but we're still here. And in despite of the losses, we, we, there's so many wonderful things that have taken place and will continue to place, take place and focus on that. Getting out in the community, this is the season of lights. Um, go view all the beautiful Christmas lights and all the, you know, um, this is a beautiful state, you know, um, whereas before we're in the hustle and the bustle, but this pandemic has slowed us down. It's, push the pause button. And so we're taking those walks. We're seeing those beautiful trees and um, streams and all that stuff that maybe we didn't pay attention to before. And so getting out and um, discovering your community, the people who live in your community, um, those kind of things, embracing those things. Yeah, well, thank you. I am going to practice some gratitude and I'm just super grateful for all of you and the work that you're doing. Um, I'm actually grateful for Seattle Public School staff. They are doing phenomenal work. I'm grateful, as you pointed out, for our families and our students. And I'm just really proud to be the uh, superintendent of Seattle Public Schools and the work that we're doing in a really tough environment. And um, But grateful for the work you're doing and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you all for joining us today, and I hope that everybody has a safe, healthy winter break. We'll be back on January 12th for our next virtual town hall, and I hope to see all of you then. So uh, happy holiday break, happy winter break, and happy 2021 very soon. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Take care.